Good afternoon to friends in Israel and the United Arab Emirates and across the broader region. Um, we're honored to be here today with three leading journalists from the UAE, Israel, and the United States who have distinguished themselves by their coverage of a series of events that have transformed the Middle East region and quite frankly, the world. The signing of the Abraham Accords and we will also discuss U.S. competition with China in the Gulf and the changing en energy markets and the impact of the coronavirus on this morning's uh, and this afternoon's discussion. We have some 250 guests that are registered. Uh, folks are joining in the waiting room right now. This will be live on YouTube, uh, or it will be recorded on YouTube, and it will be on the record. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined, as I said, by a truly global audience with participants from all over the world. Uh, I was honored to be at the White House last week for the signing ceremony uh, of the Abraham Accords. It was an amazing experience to see the culmination of a process to which I had personally dedicated a good deal of my professional career. Ultimately, while there is so much, very much to be said about the uh, Accord and about the peace treaty, at the end of the day, it comes down to one simple truism. Peace is peace. A lot has already happened since the signing of the deal. A lot more is going to happen in the weeks ahead. And I would like to look at, note at just what has happened, but also what will happen next, as I've said. To help us do so today, we're joined by three, as I said, very prominent journalists who we'll briefly introduce before we uh, begin the discussion. Mustafa Al-Rahri is the assistant editor-in-chief at The National. He has over 18 years of experience working in the UK, UAE, and broader Middle East region. He previously served as the National's business editor for four years. Mustafa was on the ground in Washington, D.C., covering the Abraham Accord signing for the National. Sophie Schulman is the capital markets editor for Calculus, a part of the Yeti Our Note Group. Sophie has been covering business in Israel for 20 years. Most recently, Sophie visited Dubai and saw firsthand some of the business deals and activities coming out of the Abraham Accords. And my good friend and colleague, John Defterios, is the Emerging Markets Editor and Anchor at CNN. Based in the network's Abu Dhabi Bureau since 2011, his reporting focuses on the, topic, on the top business stories from emerging economies with a specialty in trade, geopolitics, and energy. Please welcome our guests this morning, and we're going to jump right in to what I hope will be a very, very interesting and fascinating discussion. Ladies and gents, let's start on a personal note, if I may. Uh, I want to start a discussion about your impressions on the ground in, in Washington and the, and the region as this historic agreement was signed. How did it feel to be part of this moment? I'm going to start with you, Mustafa, because you were in Washington, D.C. Tell us what it was like, please. Uh, thank you, Danny. It's uh, a privilege to be included in this conversation. Uh, I was lucky enough to be in the Oval Office itself when the UAE delegation led by Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed was talking to President Donald Trump. And Mr. Trump uh, was in a very positive mood um, about the Abraham Accords, about being able to host uh, the signing. And, and one of the, the really telling comments that he made was that he said it was very, very important that the UAE was the first country to, to sign the Abraham Accords, to, to make this agreement to normalize relations with Israel because the UAE leads the way. So to your point about this being a process that's been ongoing for some time, your own involvement, other people's involvement behind the scenes, certainly for the UAE, it's a culmination of what it's been trying to do in the region. So to say the word historic, it, you repeat it over and over, but really, it really was. And for what the vision, a, kind, a counter vision, if you like, of peace and trade the beginning of that. That was the sense that, that I got when I was there at the White House. Thank you. Uh, 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 Sophie, you were in Dubai and John, you were in Abu Dhabi. Jump in. W what were your thoughts? First of all, Danny, I would like to thank you and the council for inviting me here for this interesting and again, historic event and historic, I, I think it was the feeling, the, the overall feeling of the delegation uh, of, uh, I think something like 30 businessmen uh, from Israel who came last week to, uh, to visit uh, Dubai and to sign some agreements. And uh, I was amazed 
I never thought oh, I would, would land in uh, Dubai uh, in any time soon. And even uh, this uh, top-notch uh, delegation of seasoned, uh, cynical uh, businessmen, I saw how they excited they were upon the warm welcome uh, and genuine uh, feeling of a uh, uh, historical and happy moment uh, which we fe was felt from the uh, UAE side and um, and I have to say but um, from what I noticed even before I went from my uh, from talking to uh, CEOs and businessmen in Israel the feeling is that uh, the our UAE counterparts did better homework and they know exactly uh, where is the potential? Not that there is a first, uh, like in Israel, we feel that this is the first uh, peace treaty which has real uh, economic uh, uh, potential and an impact. But uh, in the UAE, they know exactly what they, how they want to proceed with that, and where is the where the potential is lying. And uh, uh, CEOs of tech companies told me that. Uh, uh, one month ago, uh, when they, the normalization was only announced, uh, the same day they linked in was uh, just exploded with the uh, mails and messages from the UAE uh, businessmen asking them not about uh, on what they specialize, but even knowing specific features of their product, which means that uh, they know the, what they're talking about and they, there is huge potential there. We in Israel will have to learn more and explore more and do more research to understand uh, better where is uh, the potential of this agreement for Israel and what is the right way and the right path to, to, uh, to realize it. John. Yeah, thanks, Danny. It's good to be with uh, Sophia and Mustafa, by the way. It's good we're hearing some very interesting insights. I think first and foremost, having been here since 2011, kind of in the post-Arab Spring uh, environment, we saw the very early inklings of uh, the baby steps into the water, if you will, to get the toes in the water when IRENA, the Renewable Energy Agency, opened up here in Abu Dhabi. And it was my understanding one of the preconditions for IRENA to be based in Abu Dhabi uh, was to have Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, His Highness, and Dr. Sultan al Jaber, who was running Mazra at the time, Minister of State and obviously CEO of ADNOC now, uh, to agree to allow an ambassador from Israel to be on UAE soil. Uh, it was something that was uh, astronomical in terms of a first move step, right? And then we haven't seen a whole lot in between that period, with the exception of all of us knowing about intelligence sharing, and that makes a lot of sense because of the neighborhood we live in. And then July, I was taking a walk with my neighbors here during kind of the COVID-19 lockdown period, and I saw the Group 42 and Nanocent deal early announcement uh, not cemented on the MOU, but the fact that they were talking and they had, had plans to proceed. And I said, okay, this is the real deal. So we had the, this eight year window, right, of uh, discussions taking place behind the scenes and uh, dialogue going on what it could look like and when the conditions are right. And then when you see two business groups come together in medical security to say, we'd like to work together and this is the real deal, uh, it says a lot. Uh, my basic premise for our discussion here today is that I think that business can serve as a cement or a foundation in which to build peace upon. I think it's extremely difficult when you rely only on diplomacy to say that uh, two partners can get along, uh, that money and investment and cross trade does a lot. Uh, and my other basic premise here is that uh, the UAE and Israel don't overlap with each other. They don't compete against each other. So what does the UAE bring to the table? So if you talked about the fact they know their books, you know, they do a SWOT analysis before they go in. Uh, they have the sovereign wealth, the expertise in energy. I could see ADNOC working uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean with Israel as it develops those fields. Uh, on the other side with Israel, and I've had a chance to go, I think, a, 10 times when I was hosting Marketplace Middle East, uh, looking at the triad between technology, finance, uh, military engineering, right, and security. Uh, nobody does it better through Rothschild's uh, Avenue there and the finance that goes in to the IPO sector. This is kind of low hanging fruit for the likes of say of Mubadla, which is moving into mobility, it's moving into security, it's moving into battery storage, uh, the same areas that the expertise is being developed in Israel. So this is a win-win and I think it's very telling uh, in the announcement days of the Abraham Accord, medical, technology, banking were kind of the core pillars 
And already we've already seen the banking MOU between Emirates NBD in, in Dubai and Bank Luimi. We see DP World working on an MOU with its counterparts uh, in Israel. And we're already seeing the advances uh, in medical technology. So it's a phenomenal starting point. The other thing I would add here, we've seen that since my time in 2010-11 and coming at least a week a month in 2007, the tilt to the east by the UAE has been extremely strategic. Started with China, moved to India, and then they're kind of moving the radar here and there to say, okay, what works for us strategically? Israel works strategically from a business standpoint. And as I said before, it serves as even the glue in the relationship. Because what we've seen today with the Iranian snapback sanctions, that's gonna pose a challenge for this. It's gonna strain the relationship at some point, I would imagine raise up tensions, but the fact that Israel and the UAE are together already and have a dialogue, it'll make a difference when times get tougher. Let's put it that way. John, thank you. There's a lot to unpack there that you've said, and you've touched on a number of topics we want to address today. So thank you for setting that stage or that agenda, if you will. Uh, I was contacted a number of times in the run-up to the signing of the Abraham Accord last week by friends of mine from my long career in various Israeli ministries. And uh, to, to Sophie's point, I want to tell you how I was struck by um, the, the lack of understanding by many in the Israeli government of what the UAE is today. Uh, I, I, there is this strong tie, these strong ties in the business community already, uh, and I want to, want to pivot to that right now. But I think there is a learning curve here for, and I think it's going to happen fast because now, now folks can come back and forth and visit. But there is a learning curve here to understand just how different and how progressive the UAE is in the region, because Israelis haven't experienced that. They ha Go ahead, you have your finger up, Sophie, uh, jump in there. And this is the exact uh, point, and I think it's a great observation, because I, from what I understand and from what, what I saw in the UAE last week, the Israelis, because we live with the, here in Israel, we think that we have this notion and our understanding of the Arabic culture. And I think it's totally different what's uh, the culture of the UAE. And uh, currently we are in some kind of a honeymoon, I think, and everybody is excited. And on the Israeli side, there is a, everybody, there is a race to sign some kind of MOU and to publish in local newspaper. I signed an agreement with the, uh, some company at the UAE without even understanding what is the uh, measure, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the government involvement there in the business sector? What exactly they're looking for? We, I think many Israelis, like in Ch with China three, 30 years ago, every Israeli thought I will uh, uh, sell something to every Chinese and I will sell uh, this way like billion pieces, right, of my product. So now there is the same, uh, I think, misconception with the UAE that we will sell them our product. But from what I heard from the, even the uh, ministers of Dubai, they looking more in the, for long-term investment for maybe some uh, smart factories and manufacturing and not just the end product. Mustafa, jump in there because you were with the UAE ministers, uh, uh, Bintouk, uh, the Minister of Economy and others in Washington. Comment on that a little bit, please. What business verticals do the Emiratis want to see and, and how do they want to structure it? So Abdullah Bintouk, the Minister of Economy, was asked the question, you know, are you just coming with pockets full of money, um, you know, to, to give is, Israeli companies? And, and he's, he compared the UAE to what Israel has been described as, as a startup nation. He said the UAE can be seen as a scale up nation and that the UAE, what it really does in the region, it's a hub for the rest of Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, Af you know, uh, other parts of Africa as well. And that's the real kind of opportunity there. But kind of even broader, I spoke to Anwar Sadat's nephew, Mohammed um, Sadat, he's an Egyptian politician, and he has said the experience of, of Egypt, of, of when his uncle agreed the Camp David Accords uh, in the late 70s, that what they never really got past was the psychological barrier. They have a cold peace, but not what he says is a warm peace. So the, the bigger picture here is that there is an opportunity to use the Abraham Accords to get a lasting, sustainable solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And Sheikh Abdullah himself spoke of the Palestinians in his speech on, in front of the lawn of the White House. Um, the many, many, many officials of the UAE have been talking about it. Even the deal itself that was first announced, 
the, the deal made sure that the annexation was halted, the planned annexation by Israel. So if there, there is some movement from the Israeli side, if there is some movement from the US to find a sustainable solution to that conflict, then really the UAE can be a gateway for all the other countries as it is now for other um, nations, other trading nations, and they can get past that psychological barrier. But there is always that worry that if there isn't that solution to the wider conflict, that this opportunity could be, could be lost. It's a very important point. And to John's point about Iran, which we'll talk about a little bit later, I think through business, we're building those bridges and ties right now that will help cement uh, this relationship going for forward and be, allow us to traverse some of these uh, moments, uh, whether it's about Palestinian annexation or other things. John, from the business perspective in Abu Dhabi, say a few more words about what the Emiratis want out of this from a business uh, perspective in the broader verticals, please. Okay, good. Well, I, I think it's very clear uh, the UAE is doing, as it did with China and India, doing an evaluation of what can we uh, leverage here from Israel. I love the phrase that uh, Mustafa said here. It's, uh, it takes that technology and builds up here. It's not a startup, but it's a buildup. And I think that's what we're likely to see here. Um, I think the emphasis now, because of the big push on diversification in the country and to move in even to re renewable energy and medical technology and the response to the COVID-19 challenge, uh, this would be a very strategic area for uh, to move into Silicon Wadi there in, in Israel and say, what on the technology side can we build up in the UAE? Where can you be our partner? I think that's the first priority here, and they're not going to throw money around, but I think be very strategic and perhaps be early investors that go out in London and all on Wall Street. That seems to make perfect sense from the sovereign side. And I wanted to pick up on one point, Danny, that Sophie suggested here. Uh, when I first started going to Israel 2007, 8, and 9, I remember making calls to the central bank governor and the finance ministry's office, and I said, I've, John Defterius from Marketplace in the Middle East, I'd like to set up an interview with XYZ. And the, every single time they said, you know, Israel's not based in the Middle East, it, it's European. So we're not interested in appearing on a Middle East program. So that's an interesting. So geographically, I said, have you looked at the map, right? And I said, no, but our focus <laughs> is really Europe and the United States. And we would not like to do the interview. And I still was able to get the interview to say that it's a global program, but that's the mindset we're, we're changing. And, and I, Mustafa talked about uh, the Palestinian uh, cause here. And I was recalling in my research for the discussion today, it was May 2008 when I went to Jerusalem and it was the Palestinian Investment Conference uh, put forward by the quartet, uh, backed by the UK and the US. And at the time, talking about sacks of money, we had pledges from Qatar and some of the other Gulf states that we're gonna make this investment happen now. But there's a barrier between the two. There's a lack of understanding between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, I think this different path of diplomacy is extraordinary by the UAE in that mindset. Uh, it's my understanding from various sources, they didn't need to go to Riyadh to the site of the two holy mosques to get approval. Uh, they decided to move as an independent state, look at the opportunity uh, for both peace and for trade and for investment and say, let's make this work. As uh, Dr. Gargash had said in an interview with uh, Becky Anderson on CNN, you know, this empty chair diplomacy doesn't work. You cannot have a dialogue if you're not sitting at the table. So we've tried the empty chair diplomacy. We tried to act as a GCC group. We had disparate views about how fast and slow. Uh, let's give this a try. But he says, my chances of getting a deal on Palestine and getting an agreement from the Israelis is gonna be much easier after we put some skin in the game and made commitments to Israel. Israel has made commitments to the UAE and we have a dialogue to move forward that says a lot. And even the feedback, uh, Danny, that I'm getting from very senior people here in the UAE, they said, isn't it refreshing, John, that we have a mature, independent voice on foreign diplomacy today, and we built our confidence to take the right path. As a Greek American, I always say, okay, that's great. They're called the little spark. I think it's a, a name that, or a label that's overused, but it does suggest a new level of diplomacy by the UAE that it can make decisions on its own, engage and break through a glass wall that's been there for decades and try something different. And with money on the table, as I, it's my opening point, I think this is the cement to build on if you have trade from the start. And everybody said, oh, look, there's just a bunch of MOUs, John. It's not serious stuff. And then right off the back of it, people are already making plans for real money to go off the back 
of the structural MOUs, which is a good start in a span of uh, this two month window of, uh, of time. Thank you, John. Um, I wanna just pivot a little bit, uh, a, a quarter turn to the US role in this and the role for US business. Uh, Sophie, uh, many American companies um, that are members of the, my business council or our business council, the US UAE business council, have significant operation headquarters in, in Herzliya, in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, and they're similarly have headquarters for the Gulf and the broader Middle East in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. What, from your perspective and, and, and looking at it from uh, what, you, what you're doing with the Israeli companies, what are the opportunities for U.S. companies to play a role here in, the, in creating the connective tissue and putting down the foundations that keep this peace deal on track moving forward? Of course, uh, Danny, the, uh, there, is no, um, there is no way to exaggerate with the importance of the American multinational corporations in Israel. You know, Intel is the largest, uh, single largest employer in Israel. So uh, we all are uh, well aware. And what I think is we're speaking a lot of technology and of Israel being a startup nation and uh, how we can help uh, uh, the UAE with our agri-tech technologies and fintech technologies. But I think of all this buzz going on uh, uh, for the past weeks, the, the most um, realistic agreements and the, the real potential for now, what I see is the, the agreements between DP World and the Israeli ports uh, companies, one of the companies and the, another uh, MSC, MSC, MSCS uh, also uh, shipping from uh, Dubai to Elat and Haifa, which is uh, there is the potential, which is also wasn't understood enough in Israel of uh, the UAE uh, strategic location and being a portal and the hub for uh, the, this huge area and countries like uh, India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Malaysia, uh, countries we didn't really have a great access to before. And I think uh, when we put together the strategic location of uh, the UAE together with the strategic location uh, of Israel, for my surprise, it's even uh, for I didn't I have even haven't realized that there is a, uh, an oil uh, a way uh, on the oil path which is, uh, has been left from the British Empire period going from Kirkuk in Iraq to Haifa, which is amazing. I've walked the, I've walked those pipelines in Israel. They're still there. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing that it still exists. So there is a great connection between those two countries. And I think multinationals from the US, from Europe, can use uh, this uh, now uh, uh, short uh, passage and the uh, most, most uh, uh, fast way to, to go through uh, from Middle East to Europe, to the US. And uh, it can be a great potential for all the sides. Um, Mustafa, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I mean, just to add to that, there, there are, there's plenty of opportunity that's already ongoing. I mean, you look at aviation, and, and that was one of the sectors listed in the text of the Abraham Accord. And already you saw the impact, the, sim, the symbolism of the, of the first uh, flight from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi that flew over Saudi airspace on, in, a, in a kind of day-to-day -day aspect, um, you, shortening flight times uh, to and from Israel is, is going to have a big impact on, on business and trade, not just for the Middle East, but beyond. Um, but also when they repealed the law pretty fast in the UAE that made it illegal to do business with Israel, the, the, the consequences were felt almost immediately. I mean, anecdotally, even a stock market trader, a friend of mine works out of the DIFC, got a call straight away from his colleagues in London saying, now you can cover Israeli stocks and we don't have to wake up early anymore. So, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the Everybody seems to be moving pretty quickly on the opportunities and the momentum is there. Um, you know, as journalists, and I'm sure Sophie and, and John have the same experience, the amount of outreach from people wanting to, um, you know, talk to you now, uh, you know, on both sides to do with this story. Um, and also the number of companies we had today, uh, a deal on, on filmmaking between Abu Dhabi and, and uh, the Abu Dhabi Film Commission in Israel. So they talked about culture. But probably the most important for everybody, not just the UAE and Israel, is the cooperation on healthcare and, and, and COVID-19, uh, fighting that. And I think these things probably are going to be the fastest um, that are going to, we're going to see real, real impact and hopefully benefit 
for all people, not just. Uh, I think, I think the COVID nineteen uh, and the and the and the Israeli tech with regard to pharma and and life science is huge and a, and a big a big big piece of what's going to come. John, you were going to make an intervention. I was going to ask you to say a little bit also about energy from that regard uh, between and and Sophie mentioned it with the pipelines. Uh, a little bit about the aspect of the energy in the in the med and 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 the ties with the UAE and, and as an energy superpower, not just in oil and gas as we all know very well, but also in renewables now and in nuclear energy and everything else. John, go ahead, and then Sophie, jump in when uh, after John's done. Okay, let me start on the reverse and just pick up on some thoughts that Mustafa laid out there. He talked about aviation. I think there's two uh, sectors that are kind of going to be good acid tests of big UAE. Inc. Uh, UAE Inc. sectors that'll be really wondering whether this partnership can work. I would say aviation because of the expertise of Emirates and Etihad, but more the logistics behind uh, Dubai Airport and the new uh, soon to be opened Abu Dhabi Airport. If they do allow the UAE to partner up and help develop the infrastructure for Israel, I think that would be a win-win situation. It is my understanding from the very beginning of these talks, and I'm gonna to go to DP World, uh, to Jabal Ali next week as a result of it, uh, that it was strategically important for Israel to get a foothold into Jabal Ali. And I didn't understand why until I just talked to various sources in the last couple of days. Uh, apparently the value added tax on manufacturing, particularly higher end manufacturing is high in Israel. So they're trying to work out a structure within Jabal Ali where they can do the finished part of the manufacturing process and even some telling me that they're looking at space already to set up facilities and use it as a re-export hub. One thing that's completely overlooked in the conversations we've had as of late uh, is that Israel and that discussion I said before about always looking to Europe and to the United States, it's got a market of 400 million Arabs at its doorstep and it has a true business partner. It, it had the agreements with Egypt and Jordan but it was never seen in the business context. I actually think because of the very tight relations between the UAE and Egypt, and particularly in Jordan, which the UAE wants to see develop at a faster pace and has the energy resources by way to do so, uh, and many aspects on the solar side as well, uh, that the UAE can serve as the catalyst for the investment coming from Israel, doing it jointly and going into a market of 100 million consumers in Egypt, but going into a neighbor of Israel in Jordan and finally making it happen at the scale that you're talking about. And let me touch upon energy for a moment here. Uh, at a off the record discussion I had a, three years ago in Germany with a head of secret service uh, in Eastern Europe, which name I can obviously mention. But three years ago, uh, he was suggesting to me because of the discoveries in Israel and the discoveries in Egypt and the potential discoveries in Cyprus and Greece, the Eastern Med is the most dangerous part of the world right now. Uh, it serves as a challenge uh, to Russia on the southern flank of Europe, not at the scale yet, but the discoveries keep on coming. So I would say, yes, it's a competitor to Russia. It's a threat to Turkey and being the transit hub that it enjoys now for the pipelines coming uh, from Russia. So this is a potential you know, kind of firebomb here, if you will. Uh, we see the UAE has dedicated F-16 jet fighters to Greece. The money coming from the UAE into Greece has been astronomical in the last three years. And they particularly like this Prime Minister Mitsotakis, who's very pro-business, and they've had more dialogue over the summer, I understand, to, to build upon it. I think the Israelis would make a very good move to use the expertise of Adnok, which has unearthed a lot of value within the company, from its retail sector, from the pipelines, and now in the last month in real estate. So that expertise is something that's transferable to Israel as it builds up the Eastern Med pipeline and hopefully links it up to Europe via Cyprus and Greece and its partnership uh, with Egypt. And Danny, you touched on it. We can pick up on it later so I don't talk too long. But the renewable expertise that's built here, and we had a roundtable for the GMIS with his Excellency Haldun al-Mubarak, who said, we're now focused on hydrogen. So you know what it's like in the UAE when they decide to put the radar onto a sector, it does grow, right? And so I think in that sort of technology into the renewable space offers a great deal of opportunity in partnership with Israel looking at even solar in, in Jordan today and hooking up the grid to the nuclear power plant at Baraka. You know, it sounds far-fetched, but it's, it's there if, if they want to develop it together. I, I tried to explain to my friends in Israel and the Israeli government a number of times the, what, the power of leadership, vision, commitment, and follow-through, uh, sprinkled with resource uh, along the way. 
and the UAE has all of those elements in its recipe of, for success. And uh, that's why it's going to make an amazing partner for Israel going forward. Go ahead, John. And then, I, yeah, and just going to jump in. No, but I think we also have to have a very sober analysis because I was covering the Iranian sanctions today. I've had a chance to go to the country three times during that lifting period of uh, the sanctions uh, by the Obama administration. There's an incredible opportunity there, but let's take like 10 steps back and see what's happened today. I don't think when they had the Abraham Accords you know, signed, we'd have this conversation a week later and say, well, here comes the effort by the United States to put forward the UN snapback sanctions. Let's be realistic. I think we have to be honest with our audience here. Uh, number two, the pushback from the Europeans, uh, Britain, France, Germany was pretty forthright in terms of language uh, on Sunday, especially. 13 of 15 Security Council members said, uh, this is a no-go zone. It's not even legally uh, valid. And the Secretary General Gutierrez said there's just no reason for a debate on this subject. So that's not in the spirit of how to build a, a more peaceful Middle East. I don't think the partnership in Israel with the UAE and Bahrain and to add more countries meant to get more aggressive with Iran and around an election. So to the point of, Danny, you were asking, would US companies want to come in? I've talked to scores of them that have a presence here. They want peace. You know, they're not interested in rolling the dice on a situation that it's that volatile, let's put it that way. And I think it's a big point to make on a day when we saw that maneuver in the last three or four days uh, by the State Department. Sophie, I want to let you speak here, and then I want to come back to Iran, because this is a very, very important topic. Please, but go ahead. I will connect a little with your previous points, uh, Mustafa and John, uh, not going to the Iran issue yet, but uh, speaking about the uh, pharmaceutical industry, I heard uh, yesterday that there are some pharmaceutical shipments already going on from Israel to uh, the UAE, even though, unfortunately, as we are the startup nation, but uh, I cannot uh, say that we are handling the COVID-19 very well. We started a new lockdown on uh, Friday, and it's uh, all uh, quite disappointing that uh, our technology cannot help us uh, enough. And uh, I think there is a clash between the technology and the governmental uh, and, so, and the society issues. Uh, so uh, technology does, cannot solve uh, every problem uh, uh, on earth. It uh, needs some uh, cooperation uh, by uh, the people them themselves. And um, if I um, speak, but let's uh, talk about the agreements and the, the UAE expertise on the, the energy sector, it's, uh, it's amazing because uh, what surprised me the most is uh, that uh, Mr. Sultan Ahmed Ben Sulaim and other leaders uh, told that uh, in the UAE uh, people and leaders wait for the oil to run down and it will be a big celebration when the oil is over because you can go to the next uh, step uh, on the, of development. And uh, it's, it's amazing because in Israel, we have all the technology, but we dream about uh, the energy sector and uh, specifically about uh, the gas uh, quite recently discovered and we don't really know well how to handle it and uh, uh, how to make the most of it. And our, uh, we, we have sovereign uh, uh, wealth fund, but there is nothing there yet. And it's uh, also a huge challenge how to uh, handle this issue without uh, in, in the uh, going is keeping this border between uh, the democracy and functioning uh, uh, capital markets. And the going uh, to the capital markets, it, uh, I was uh, also surprised that you said that you uh, uh, cover and you uh, follow uh, Israeli uh, stock exchange, which is, uh, we consider it uh, quite a uh, dead man working. <laughs> and we mostly look uh, for NASDAQ and uh, Wall Street in general. But we are a renewable energy companies heavy on our stock exchange. And it's amazing because we consider it lately as a high tech. And even the, in the delegation with me was one of the, was CEO of, of the largest uh, renewable energy company called Enlight. And he was uh, so excited about the potential. And surprisingly, the potential, he said that the market in the UAE uh, for solar energy is quite uh, uh, busy already. And the big potential, what I heard also from the another side, is going to third countries together uh, as a joint venture between Israel and the UAE. And I think that would be a real, uh, real piece and the real uh, fruit of this uh, 
of uh, Abraham uh, records, uh, occurrences. Uh, we could imagine it if uh, the two of us, uh, we can go together. Sophie, you mentioned a number of things where the Emiratis have a tremendous expertise, sovereign wealth funds, uh, the expo uh, exploration and exploitation, if you will, the oil and gas and, and, and other sectors and energy. And uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for collaboration where they can help you help Israel understand their experiences and what they've learned and vice versa. Uh, so I'm, I think that's really, really strong. Mustafa and John, I wanna, I wanna pivot and open the lens here a little bit to John introduced Iran uh, in the discussion. Clearly from Dr. Anwar Gargash's comments about Iran and the role of Iran with regard to uh, the Abraham Accords, uh, everyone in the UAE, everyone in Israel came to, to this agreement very clear-eyed about the U.S.'s objectives uh, with regard to Iran, especially in the next six weeks uh, in the run-up to our elections here. Uh, so Mustafa, just say a few words more about, uh, John mentioned the idea of political risk and how business looks at, at, at risk in the region. Um, say a few more words about your experience with the UAE delegation and, 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 and the business on the ground at the moment and how they're looking at the Iran situation for the, for the next six weeks. Are you worried that something's going to, excuse the expression, blow up uh, with regard overall or, or, or do you think things are going to be pretty well, stable? Well, I, I'll tell you when I was really worried. I mean, I was worried last year when right. we had, we right. had the, ves the vessel sabotaged, we had Abqaiq attacks a year ago and then at the beginning of the year i remember it was a friday coming to the newsroom you know all hands on deck for when qasem al-soleimani the uh, revolutionary guard al-quds force commander was was killed in baghdad i was scared then you know uh, for the region for what was going to happen um and now we are nine months on and i mean i'll take you to the white to back to the white house where in mr trump's speech he spent a lot of time thanking his team, whether Jared Kushner, senior advisor, whether it was um, Brian Hook, the Iran envoy. You know, he spent a lot of time calling their names out because it seemed that day, um, that Tuesday, seems a long time ago now, but it really wasn't, um, was a big win for the diplomats. And the Abraham Accords is a big win for diplomacy. Now, there was a time, you know, before the... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the Trump administration, when perhaps with the, the past Iran nuclear deal, they would have thought the same thing, that it was, a, it was a win for diplomacy. But clearly, countries in this region felt that that was not a win for diplomacy, and it only opened the door to problems. So now, to a certain extent, they're dealing with those problems, and they have to deal with them. There's no way, there's no way around them, because you look at Lebanon, you look at Syria, you look at Yemen, you look at the situation, you talked about Turkey, um, and and their, their, their policy is not diplomacy, or at least it's some kind of strange, not gunboat boat diplomacy, but oil drill diplomacy, where they've got this ship sailing around the Eastern Med causing a ruckus with the Greeks. Um, but for the UAE, for the Abraham Accord, for that's the idea is you get around the table, you talk, you find your areas of interest. So I'm not so worried as I was in 2019, because at least we can see a positive experience for diplomacy when last year we really, we didn't know where we were headed. Got it. John. Uh, let me pick up on a, on a thought that I had as this was uh, coming together as an announcement. And I thought, you know, why now? I, I know uh, President Trump and obviously the work of Jared Kushner would like to get it before the election. It's a, a foreign policy victory for the United States. And then I started thinking in the context of Israel and the UAE um, and in a sense, they could you know, use this as a hedge against a change in the White House, right? Because we know the indications from uh, Joe Biden, if he became president, he'd like to reestablish the nuclear accord with much better adherence to the spirit of the agreement by Iran. So he has to hold a firm line on that and not look weak. But this is almost an insurance policy by the Israelis and the UAE and Bahrain and probably other Arab states are gonna join is that they've established a partnership with each other now. Imagine them trying to do so after the elections. I think it would have been almost impossible. So the United States had its objectives, so obviously to do something before the elections. But I think on the other side, knowing how clever the UAE and Israel can be strategically, they said, you know, this time is right. Yes, it gives a nod to the United States working on the peace for prosperity, which did not work, but this is a good solid plan B. 
but it's better to, for us to have a dialogue and you almost, in a sense, I don't want to go overboard with this, but to say there's a Sunni shield being developed here in the Gulf that has a dialogue with Israel that gives a united front against Iran, right? So always in the past, you could stick a wedge between the Sunni Arabs and Israel at different times. The U.S. could even manipulate it if it needed to and say, well, this is what Israel believes and that's our partner and this is what the Gulf Arabs believe. We'll manage that relationship. I think as a result of this now, with this dialogue, it does change the game quite radically, right? Um, again, I, I'm quite worried for the region though, Mustafa. I, I differ on this because I worry about an October surprise uh, people talking about that. The USS Nimitz is in the, the Persian Gulf, the first time we've had an aircraft carrier there in, in 10 months. Uh, and I would use the analogy in this instance of the wounded tiger. That's what Iran is right now. Three years, US sanctions has wiped out about 20% of GDP. Uh, the unemployment rate is 16%, double that with the youth. Uh, oil production has gone from three and a half million barrels in 2018 to below two. It's painful. The Rial hit another, because of the snapback discussions over the weekend, hit another record low today. So I could see something kind of spurring out of the moment here around the elections. And with that wounded tiger, taking a few swipes at, at the, this new Abraham Accord, this test how strong it is, and also send a signal to the United States, less so about this, the, the new partnership. John, Mustafa, Sophie, what about more broadly in the region and more Abraham Accord add-ons? Uh, Oman, Morocco, Sudan, we hear rumors that, they're, that they might come soon. Saudi Arabia, uh, we hear discussions going on. I, I, I can't judge how, how accurate they are about between, with, with Qatar and trying to resolve the Gulf Rift and bringing Qatar onto the Abraham Accord uh, process. Are, are any of these possible before the elections from your just a quick two finger intervention by each of you on that question. Start with Sophie. Well, I'm really not an expert on the, the Arab Israeli conflict and the, and the region. I'm more of the business uh, person. And I, but I really have to comment about you to previous remarks because it's surprising for me and I might am risking here of being non politically correct because of, in my feeling, it was less a, a diplomacy achievement, but uh, as a President Trump referred to it during his speech as a transaction. So in my feeling, and I think I uh, hear uh, some Israelis also feel and stop me if it's not going into the right direction, because it, it seems like everybody's getting what they want and not specifically uh, in a, a political way. It's uh, the UAE gets the F-35 and the Israelis get uh, the annexation uh, currently off the table and uh, America gets a, a huge uh, achievement and uh, taking uh, Mr. Trump maybe to his uh, next, uh, uh, another, uh, next election uh, win. So uh, I don't know. I really want to be hopeful that this is a peace process. Uh, I was a great enthusiast of an Oslo uh, peace process and the, and the, all the, and, and the, of course, uh, well, Camp David, I was born into it, but, uh, uh, so I really would like to hope that this is the first agreement in the, in a row of great agreements with creating the new uh, Middle East and uh, the new uh, Gulf region. But uh, it seems currently for me that it all depends on uh, what will be on the table. Uh, it's not uh, maybe in the international relations uh, uh, paradox, but more on the business uh, level. Sophie, respectfully, I appreciate all of your comments, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject what I said at the beginning. As someone who's been on the peace teams with President Clinton and others, at the end of the day, the peace is peace with regard to this agreement. And that is the foundation from where everything else is starting, in my, in my humble view. Mustafa and then John, please, about um, uh, what we were just talking about. I mean, I think we want more transactions, if they're like that. I think that, that'll be a good thing. Um, <laughs> I don't mind what we call them, um, but the the I, I mean I would say more broadly, and, and I don't want to I don't want to yeah maybe I'm coming across as the naive one on the on the panel, and I don't I don't certainly mean to, but the 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 text of the Abraham Accord pretty high up talked about um, sort of interfaith tolerance, religious tolerance, and and I and I feel like over the last few years in particular, every 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 kind of big issue that the UAE has approached, they've come from a very soft 
the soft side of things that, you know, it's not always hard numbers. Um, you know, that was 10 years ago. That was before the financial crisis. Everybody, that's what people wanted. But now, especially young people in the region, outside the region, they want to know that they can live, um, you know, a productive uh, life. And so the, but I think the intention behind everything is, is to create that atmosphere. And I think that's how business gets done now. You know, it's it probably the way Mr. Trump does business is, is, is on the way out. Um, and the way you do it is by creating an atmosphere and everyone feels they're included. There's an opportunity in which to grow, in which to do your thing. And I think the Abraham Accords is kind of a new type of deal in that sense. So, I mean, I encourage everyone to go see the text of it because, you know, it's one of the first things that's put out there is, you know, this interfaith, interreligious tolerance. And, and that's the spirit in which they're approaching this. Then they talk about all the sectors from which they can cooperate and which business deals can be done. And of course, they're talking about maybe half a billion dollars worth of deals, more in trade. So yes, it's very transactional. What it could mean for the wider picture, the wider issue, you know, Jared Kushner claims to be an optimist and that's why he's shuttling around doing all these things. Um, you know, let's hope that, you know, that, that his optimism, his energy, you know, whatever you may call it, he's doing it for himself, for the US, for Mr. Trump. No doubt there's self-interest there. But let's hope that, you know, six months from now, we can say it was something we built on and it, it led to more, more transactions. Most if I couldn't agree with you more, I'm going to go to you, John, but I couldn't agree with you more. I've gone back and mm -hmm. read the agreement now three or four times and it starts here so big and so broad. And then it gets to some of the transactions that are going to have to occur and that should occur in my view. John, go ahead. I no, I just say. For a sec, I just yeah, really but... feel like I have to explain myself because I would like to be a, a naive person in this, uh, you know, in this world. But uh, unfortunately, I think that specific situation here in Israel with the Mr. Netanyahu and his uh, indictments, that's what makes people in Israel more cynical about it and I really I am the peace uh, you know the peace side and I want to be optimistic and that's what was important for me to uh, clarify. Sophie so wonderful for you to underscore that thank you so much go ahead John. No no problem I'll pick up on uh, Mustafa's thoughts here on the interfaith dialogue I mean the, the UAE kind of broke new ground obviously when Pope Francis visited here we had the honor to cover it which was extraordinary in itself uh, I was at the Louvre uh, over the weekend and had a chance to see, again, this East-West connection and the sharing of dialogues and religions. Uh, they've broken down a number of barriers there. So which better partner for Israel in which to, to build upon? And that's not blowing smoke at anybody. That's just, uh, that's the reality that we face today. I talked about it earlier about the UAE independence and foreign policy today. This was a major step for the GCC, which always comes in from different angles and never can step forward as a common force, even on monetary policy as Mustafa knows, and trying to create a single currency. That hasn't happened. So again, I think having a moderate, visionary, uh, not overly aggressive uh, UAE, not moving too fast is what I mean by aggressive here, and proceeding with such a, a landmark deal with uh, Israel and opening the door to Bahrain. I remember I was in Bahrain last year and saw Jared Kushner with the Crown Prince of Bahrain and the dialogue there. And it was in the spirit of peace for prosperity with the wider Palestinian deal. But the fact that he had so much dialogue to his credit created this opportunity that Danny's talking about. So what is the next wave? There's discussions with Qatar and trying to break the embargo here. Some of the 13 points remain log jams as Mustafa well knows. I think it would be obvious to go far west to Morocco, the relationship with His Highness uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed and the King of Morocco goes back to their childhood, uh, growing up with Sheikh Zayed obviously. And that's a very solid relationship. You could see it being leveraged. Uh, Saudi Arabia, I thought the piece in the Wall Street Journal this weekend, I would encourage others to read it. Uh, Stephen Callan and Summer Saeed was excellent at looking at the potential divisions between King Salman and uh, His Highness Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, and perhaps that there's a generational shift and King Salman remains dedicated to the two-state solution. And that's what it has to be before we sign on the dotted line. I think that's up for grabs now. Uh, and I think to Sophie's point and Mustafa's point, a younger generation says, and I saw this, Danny, in Cyprus. I went to Southern Cyprus, I went to North Cyprus. They don't care anymore, this generation. They don't want the legacy to be worried about the legacy issues that are on the table. They just said, we want opportunity, number one. We would love to have peace in our lifetime. Why right. is it that this is a divided island? And I think, by the way, that would be fantastic because Israel served as a catalyst 
to get Qatar back into the GCC. Would it, that'd be a, a big offshoot out of this because it's been a log jam for three years. But we have to watch Saudi Arabia. It's obviously the biggest challenge here because of its scale, the role it plays, and the generational leadership of King Salman. Thank you, John. We have a, a few minutes left and there's two last topics I wanna to cover really quickly. We talked about, uh, we've opened the lens and talked about, or widened the lens and talked a little bit about Iran. What about China? Um, look, I, I worked at the Pentagon and one of my, uh, Sophie, one of my files at the Pentagon back in the day was the Israel-China file and uh, the cooperation uh, between the two countries in tech and defense and other things that was occurring at the time. Uh, the UAE, as John mentioned earlier on, has pivoted to the east uh, because primarily because of the oil flows and the energy flows, but also because uh, China is in many ways the future uh, with, with a billion and a half people and what's going on there with their economic revolution. So China is a huge issue for the United States, in, uh, tremendous. So how can the Israel and the UAE and their relationships with China, uh, what, how can that help uh, with where the U.S. goes with China in the future. And uh, maybe we'll start with you, John, and work backwards on this. And we have five minutes for this, and then I want to, one other topic, please. Okay, I'll, I'll make it quick. I, I followed this because it's one of my passions, right? Looking at the bilateral relationships, what the UAE has done with China and India over the last decade uh, is extraordinary. Uh, but there's truth to what the United States has to say, and people need to wake up to the Chinese challenge, right? Danny's nodding his head. I'm sure he's in agreement. What's transpired in Africa uh, and uh, Sophie, let's bring it into the Haifa port, for example, with Costco trying to go in and develop. The first decade or two of China in that operation, you know, it's great. And I know this from firsthand experience in Piraeus in Greece. It created 1,500 jobs, five Chinese managers. If you see the, ha the half the port that the Chinese are operating, 12 new cranes, brand new, humming along. On the other side, the state-run operations hobbled. In the last year, they took over the lease agreements of three major Italian ports from the north to the center to the south. Uh, we need to wake up to that challenge. Uh, the Chinese wanted to take over the rail system from Greece going into the southern Europe, which was eventually blocked and ended up having another buyer. Uh, it was important enough to the United States to have Mike Pompeo take a special trip, visit Israel in May and say this Haifa deal with Costco is not a fantastic deal. So it is a Trojan horse for the Chinese. You have to look at the development that's come along with it. They do invest and it, it does you know, pay dividends, but one has to look at the long-term of debt legacy in the places like Sri Lanka and the port, right? And countries in Africa that have suffered the same. So we do need to wake up to the Chinese challenge. Uh, they are aggressive and they use, just like DP World uses it to plant flags around the world and so does Emirates, uh, but they do it in a much more aggressive fashion. I think I can say it that way. Sophie, in a, in a minute or two, your response on China. Yeah, so, so uh, I think in Israel, uh, regarding to China, Israel finds itself in a peculiar position because uh, as, uh, as the US is our main ally, but on the other side, Chinese, the Chinese come and they want everything they, we have. And uh, uh, there were cases uh, that Chinese uh, funds or Chinese related funds uh, were interested in buying Israeli insurance companies and the Israeli regulator uh, didn't uh, let them do that. Uh, but on the other side, uh, if, I, if I mention again Intel and its central position in Israel, a huge part of uh, Israeli experts in semiconductor, uh, semiconductors, it's Intel uh, pro pro products to China. So we, of course, uh, the U.S. is our main uh, uh, expert uh, ally, but uh, Chinese is the most fast uh, growing, uh, and we cannot let it uh, just go. But we already we aware of all the challenges. And as I mentioned before, if uh, 30 years ago, uh, Israel is uh, dreamt on uh, selling to Chinese, now they know what are the risks because many high-tech companies uh, uh, did uh, meet that challenge but when they understood that ch the Chinese are trying to buy it and then copy it and then uh, produce it by themselves, maybe for cheaper, and I think it's a very difficult tango to dance for for Israel, staying uh, between the, both sides. And I, if we can learn from from the UAE expertise, it might be interesting to hear how how you handle that. I I, I was in Israel ten years or so ago for the Herzliya conference and staying at the hotel up in Herzliya, 
and I was shocked, Sophie. Everyone at breakfast was Chinese, and they were all there buying China, buying Israeli apps and Israeli technology. And that caused that, that was a big concern by the U.S. government at the time. I think we've worked through a lot of that in the last few years, but it's a, it was a major development. Mustafa, go ahead. A, a word about China from Abu Dhabi and Dubai's perspective. I mean, I think they've handled it pretty well. If, if we use the example of uh, the oil and gas concessions, you have Chinese uh, partners, you have U.S. partners, you have U Korean, Japanese, European. I mean, there, there seems to be room for everybody, um, which is good. Um, but I think also, and, you know, this is Chinese experts have said this to me, that they believe that, you know, Arab countries in general look at the relationship with the U.S. through the prism of security, and perhaps they don't look through th that same prism with the Chinese. And it's a, a different conversation and one that isn't necessarily a competitive one. They, they talk about different things. So, so perhaps, you know, there's that, that's at least the way they see it from here. So maybe there isn't quite that jeopardy. I got it. I understand. I think there's going to be a lot more conversations about China uh, with the UAE in particular in the future. I want to end on a little bit of a higher note. I know John has children. I'm Sophie. I don't know if you do or Mustafa, if you do, but I want to end on the note if we could talk a little bit about the cultural and educational aspects of all of this. John alluded earlier to this being about uh, for the future, uh, for the youth, and the youth and and others and the youth not wanting to deal with the the conflict with Palestine anymore. But I know from talking with many Emirati leaders uh, that this is also about the, the, the future of a positive future uh, for the region and for Israeli and Arab youth to be coming together in a way that was never, ever possible before. So if you had to say a, word, a couple words about what you might be telling your children or your nieces and nephews, if you have them, how do you talk to your youth about the historic importance of this agreement and what it means for the future? Sophie, start with you. Do you have any kids? I have three boys, so uh, as you can imagine, uh, I uh, don't want them to go and serve in the army. And uh, I hope, uh, they, uh, as every generation in Israel says, by the time you will grow up, uh, you won't have, the army won't be mandatory. So it's my uh, huge hope, and now maybe we are lending, uh, laying some base for for this uh, hope uh, for, for a really for the first time, maybe second time since Oslo, but Oslo, I, unfortunately, it didn't uh, grow up to, to be what uh, we hoped it would be. And maybe uh, maybe by the time your, your boys have to do their army service, there will be mutual exchanges between the UAE and the Israeli military, and, they'll, and they could do their, some of their army service in, uh, in, in, in Abu Dhabi. I hope so. I was really excited when uh, we were last week in Dubai, and uh, we were said that we were told that uh, the children there in the schools will start learning Hebrew. And my children personally were really excited about me going to the UAE. They completely understand the the historical uh, moment, and they even say, "Why don't they cover it a little bit more than the COVID-19 for Israel?" It was a really bad timing in the of the signing of the Abraham Accords because it was on the same day that they announced the new lockdown. So everybody were quite depressed. But I really believe and I want to believe that we are starting uh, something new here and I really will be quite and happy when my children will go to the army. The, the, the biggest uh, will have to go in four years. The youngest uh, have uh, 14 till then. So uh, at some point in the middle, I really hope uh, it, we will succeed. Mustafa, a quick, quick intervention on your part. Do you have kids? I do. I have two boys, uh, two young boys. And I, I have been braced for many years for the difficult conversations I'm going to have because I'm Iraqi and my wife's Palestinian. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about, various conflicts and wars. And, and I would say that at least last week was something, when that was agreed, is something that isn't necessarily about a conflict or, you know, very tough situation. It's fairly straightforward to explain and the values behind it are, are, are fairly uh, positive. So, you know, that's at least one tick for the easy part of that conversation. Thank you, sir. And John, finally. Uh, no, I have two daughters, uh, 15 and 17. They lived here in the UAE very happily for six years, but I do the shuttle diplomacy between uh, Abu Dhabi and London uh, these days, and they were very excited. In fact, we had a long conversation, Skype conversations, 
about the temp, uh, potential of the Abraham Accord that I think it was just a political gesture for Donald Trump or something much wider. And then we talked about the wider potential of it, uh, which I think is, uh, offers a great opportunity. And I use the same themes. I said, you lived here during the most an extraordinary time, 2011 onwards, when the UA UAE started to make its steps on its own on the diplomacy I've been talking about for the last hour with my colleagues here. Uh, and this is the real deal. And I hope it leads to something much better for the Palestinians. I mean, we just cannot overlook it. Water rights, the ability to manufacture, uh, and the rest to give the opportunity to the Palestinians and solve the problems in Lebanon. I hope it comes out of this. And, and that's how I left it with them. And they were uh, smiling by the end of it, Danny. <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again to all of our panelists uh, and the audience for joining us today. We will have this up on YouTube a little bit later. This has been a fascinating, fascinating discussion. We're going to be hosting more of these. Uh, this is the first one that we posted between uh, UAE, US, and Israeli friends, and we're going to have a more uh, of a schedule and agenda for that. We'll we hope you'll be able to join us later this week for two webinars that are exactly in this same uh, ballpark. We're doing one on hosp hospitality tomorrow and the reopening of the hospitality uh, vertical in the UAE. And on Wednesday, we're doing one on the future of the UAE free zones with the leadership of DMCC, JAFSA, and Mazdar. Uh, again, key uh, trade zones, free zones, if you will, that are gonna be critical to the uh, cooperation going forward with Israel and are already in the process of signing deals. So ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, thank you so much. Uh, good morning to all of you in the US and good evening in the UAE and Israel. Please have a wonderful uh, uh, week ahead. All the best, thank you. <laughs>